good afternoon and welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the Society for Ad Collection second webinar on the importance of provenance and resale rights. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, just you know, quick um, quick word about what the Society for Ad Collection is about and what we stand for. Society for Ad Collection is a registered charity committed to providing a platform for the exchange of ideas amongst art collectors whilst promoting an appreciation for the arts. The Society through systematic, knowledgeable and organized means will it's a how-to guide for novices as well as established collectors, journalists, critics, dealers, gallery owners, investors, and scholars on how to navigate the exclusive part of art collection. So, in in a, in a sense, we're trying to you know democratize what it means to be, you know, what it means to be, you know, what, you know, what it means to understand what what art collection is about and everything around, you know, um, all the tidbits around, you know, details around what art collection is about, because we believe as a society that everybody should understand what it's about. It shouldn't be something that is for a select few, you know, everybody has what it takes to, number one, appreciate art, number two, you know, start in some way to start to build your own collection. And that's also what we do in providing you the education on how to do that. Art to us is a social, economic and cultural experience. It is more than a physical object, but transference into sentiments beyond its creation, the emotions evoked, its observers, and the value accorded by society. So I want to welcome everybody and thank you very much for taking out time from your busy schedule to join us today. Today, we will be talking about the importance of provenance and resale rights. And we have three special guests who will be taking us through this all important topic for both art artists and art collectors and anybody who's in the arts, you know, in the arts, the arts, you know, sector, and anybody who's a lover of the arts, just to have an understanding of what it, it's, these, these concepts are really about. So our very first guest is um, Anna Colazo Acha. She's an art lover and the founder of Our Ron Korn, uh, an African art gallery and aggregator platform that set out to acquire African art and also doing art business. They also represent artists. She's also the editor of Malimbi, an official in-flight magazine for local airlines in Nigeria. She's worked on several, you know, artistic projects in and out of the country. I want to welcome her specially. So Anna Kolaza, actually, thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Our second special guest is Adirunke Akienle Bolanli, who is an art advisor and curator based in the UK and Lagos. She's the founder of Jadi Art Consulting, an art consulting company that provides advisory services, art collection, management and curated projects. She's worked on several prominent art projects in Africa and Europe. Darren Kerr, thank you so much for joining us. You're, you're welcome. We've also got Chinyere Akachiku, who's an intellectual, pro intellectual property lawyer with Kenner Partners. She advises on domestic and cross-border transactional art law issues dealing with purchases, sales, loans, exhibitions, and consignments of art. She has also advised multiple art galleries on the business and the operational management in all aspects of art. In her free time, she's an artist, and she also, you know, works with us here at Sacco. So, Chinyere, thank you so much for joining us. So, without further ado, we're going to kick off. Um, and Anna, the floor is yours as you take us through what you have for us. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much for that introduction and also for my. I'm going to start sharing my screen right now. Uh, let me know. Is working? Hello? Yeah, it's working. We can see your screen. Is Go it ahead. working? Yes. Okay, perfect. Sorry. All right, wonder. So Today I'm going to try to cover the topic of provenance as best as possible. Those who are like me, a little bit of a cre creative mind and people who love art, uh, please try to stay with me because this is for researchers, for bibliographers uh, and free minds. We prefer to talk, you know, about the artwork and not the provenance, but I'm going to do my best. OK, so this is the index of what we're going to cover. We will explain what is provenance. Uh, we will show how to conduct for those who want to take uh, on the challenge. Uh, we're going to review the documents that you need. Uh, we're going to explain why is it important. Uh, we will see some samples and we will finish by looking at uh, technologies are thankfully uh, making provenance research a little bit easier and a little bit more uh, attractive. We're also going to look at differences between provenance, uh, provenience, uh, certificate of authenticity, 
and catalog resume. Sometimes, you know, people mix all these things, so we will try to explain as well the differences, okay? So we started the things to come from, and it is the registry of ownership, custody, and location of a, a historical object, okay? As you can see here, it covers all the documented history of the whereabouts of the object from the date that it is created to, uh, to today, to the present day, okay? So provenance, which is ownership and whereabouts of the item is different from provenience, okay? Because provenience is actually the fine spot. So the place where the item was first found and it is a term that is normally used more in archaeology, okay? Um, so both provenance and provenience are also very different from the legal, legal title, uh, but they will help us actually determine who is the current legal owner of, uh, of an item, okay? Uh, provenance today, uh, we're going to use it as a term for works of art, but it's used in many other fields, including archaeology, books, uh, wine, classic cars, or jewelry, okay? So, for example, in wine, provenance is where the wine has been stored, at what temperature, the characteristics of the bottle, etc. okay? Uh, I always like to use the sample of cars or jewelry because it is very clear that we would pay a very different price for a classic car or a ring that has been owned by a king or by a politician in the past, okay? So the same happens as well with art sometimes. It's not only about the item itself or about the artist, but who has owned this item in the past. This is also a very important part of the history of the artwork, okay? Uh, so how do experts document the history, this, this chain of custody in artworks? So as you can imagine, the provenance research is kind of a tech work, okay? And it can be very difficult and time consuming because the older the item it is, the more difficult it tends to be to find all that information, okay? Uh, many times uh, the documents are damaged, they're destroyed, especially during wars or natural disasters. And then there are many galleries that are maybe small or they're short-lived galleries. They not always preserve their own records, okay? Even us owners, when we collect Many times we don't even keep the bills, especially when the items are inexpensive, okay? So when this happens, we end up with gaps in provenance because there are documents that are missing or information that is lost, okay? Now, when, when there's no gaps, what, is, what does a provenance include, okay? There's three things, three main things. You see them here. Uh, but the important thing is that this these things, all these items, they need to be backed uh, with documents, okay? So we have the owner's names. Uh, this is when and from whom a collector acquired the work. Uh, experts usually take notes of any dates in the collector's life, including, uh, including birth, including death, marriage. So all the collectors that are listening, you might be in some of those databases of collectors, okay? Then the other thing we need is the dates and own of ownership and the methods of transference, okay? This could be uh, a sale, a gift, a donation, inheritance, um, and it shall include the names of everyone who was involved in the transaction, either companies, dealers, museums, galleries, anything, okay? And finally, provenance includes as well the location of the artwork at all times, okay? Even though this seems a little bit easy, um, it's true that there's a lot of people nowadays not forging only the artwork, but there's a lot of forgery as well in documents, okay? These people, they create false documents to confuse these hi historical uh, records uh, and take benefit from that, okay? Uh, so that means that each of these documents in provenance, normally they should be checked independently, okay? So it's, it's actually an enormous, uh, an enormous work. I'm going to show you in this uh, next slide, you can see the mother book of provenance, okay? This was published only in 2001, so it's not that, uh, that old, and it was the first of its kind. Uh, the name you can see there is the AAM, Guide of Provenance Research, is a must for any collecting institution, and it's a comprehensive book that tells you step by step how to trace the ownership uh, history of works of art. 
it contains methodology, it tells you how to assemble the information, it has inventories, databases, uh, case studies as well, okay? So the first thing that this book tells us to do is obviously to inspect the work, the artwork, okay? This is because the artwork is at the end of the day the most valuable item and it's a source of provenance in itself, okay? Uh, as you can see here, all these items, uh, the artwork tells us the median, tells us the support. And you know that sometimes, even just looking at the brand of the paper uh, in one uh, artwork, for example, this can confirm if this item was produced in a specific era or not. We have the signature and date, which tell us, you know, the, uh, the first date uh, where we have information about this item. We have then the back of the, the back of the painting, this has very, very important information usually, okay? It can have inscriptions, you can have uh, exhibition marks, you can have dealer stamps, uh, gallery labels. This will tell us a lot about the whereabouts of the item uh, at a specific time, okay? And then finally, there's a lot of uh, also information in transport or shipping because we might have uh, in the item as well some custom stamps, for example, okay? For those who love this detective work, uh, there's actually a very interesting program in the BBC. Uh, it's called Fake or Fortune. Uh, and they do they, they investigate mysteries behind works of art to confirm if these items are actually priceless or they're just copies, you know? Uh, and they have found um, fakes in items that everyone thought uh, they were actually real, okay? And this sometimes happens when they look at these small things at the shipping labels or uh, the gallery stamps, okay? Now, here you have a list of documents that give you information about the ownership and the whereabouts of the works, okay? Obviously, first, uh, you have the, the bills of sale, the receipts. Uh, sometimes when you buy something from a collector or from someone else, um, you, you, you think that all the previous times where this item has been sold are, ins are insignificant, okay? But if you don't have a copy of that, that means already there's a gap in provenance, okay? Other uh, documents where we find information, uh, appraisals, okay? These are usually done by auction houses or for private, uh, with private appraisal companies. We have the R loss check. Uh, these are uh, documents, due diligence uh, documents, showing proof that the object was registered before as lost or as stolen at one point in time. There are several companies that provide this, uh, this service. One is Art Recovery International, for example. Then we have the inheritance documents. We have certificates of authenticity. We have the artist catalog resume. Uh, we can have conservation reports. This can include from x-rays to evidence of previous uh, repairs or um, missing parts. It can include like infrared photographs. Uh, the most important thing is this is any technicality that has happened in the item, but it has to be registered by a conservator, okay? Then we have, for example, photographies. Uh, this could be from the artist in the studio with the artwork, or it could be the collector with a finished item, or the artist and the collector. Many times these photographs are key to uh, confirm the authenticity of artworks, okay? We have, for example, letters or correspondence from the artist to the collector, let's say. There are many cases where we can see love letters, and this is a piece of provenance. Um, there are later uh, press releases or attributions, anything that has been published about the artist or about the artwork or about one exhibition where he was, this is very important as well. Uh, the same with literature, any journals, personal notebooks, anything that has been in a book in a magazine, in a newspaper, these are very important documents for provenance. Um, the last thing where you can find uh, this type of information is in the events, okay? Uh, it could be at museum, uh, museum or gallery exhibitions or at auctions, etc. okay? The most important thing is that if the work was included in a public exhibition or in an auction, chances are good that it was also published in, in a catalog, okay? And this catalog contains information that is also important now. So why is uh, provenance so key and so important for, uh, for a collector, okay? So provenance determines three, three main things that you see here. Authenticity, valuation, and ownership. 
And anyone who owns a painting, uh, I'm sure we, we all agree that we want to make sure that all these three things are very clear with our items, okay? So for example, providence, uh, provenance in authenticity, uh, those documents, they help us confirm the date, they help us confirm who's the artist, uh, especially for uh, portraits as well, who is the subject of the portrait, etc. So they can confirm if a painting or an artwork is authentic or not. Uh, in valuation, as we said already, uh, it's very important because sometimes people who have owned the item before give also an extra value to the painting okay so this can change everything and and we said it as well with photographs if we have a photograph of a painting with a king or a politician the item can increase in value and then in terms of ownership uh provenance give us a clear explanations of who has the legal title okay and how uh the legal title has moved from one person to another and this can help this uh, uh solve disputes or, or, or proof ownership, okay? Um, and this is very important because as you can see here in this, uh, in this sentence, it is estimated that, that 15 to 20% of uh, art in museums are either forged or misattributed. So we actually, it, it's proof that we have to do a better job with provenance. Uh, we have been hearing lately a lot about this term, uh, but problems with ownership and looted art are not new. They were actually very, very frequent between 1933 and 1945, uh, with the works that were changing hands in the uh, Nazi-controlled areas during World War II. Uh, okay? uh, this issue was so big that even today, the American Alliance of Museums, they have um, special and different standards for the obligations of the museums with this, um, in this area, okay? in this, in this, uh, from the World War II. And obviously now it has become increasingly important in Africa in recent years. We are living a very special moment. Uh, I'm sure you have seen in the press uh, that the items from the Venin bronzes are, are going to be returned to Nigeria by Germany. And now it, we need to be very conscious about this because now it is Nigeria's responsibility to ensure that good provenance reports are created for those items because if we had that in the past, then we wouldn't, this, this wouldn't have happened in the first place, okay? Uh, so provenance, as you can see, helps establish the legal, uh, but also the moral validity of the artworks. Germany is sending them back because, uh, because they think it's not ethical to keep something that is not yours, okay? Uh, they have also, uh, for your information, they have also um, established a $2 million uh, funding provenance research for these type of items. And even also many museums in Britain, they are now employing special staff just to review the items that they have from this colonial era, okay? So this is a little bit what we've, uh, what I wanted to tell you about provenance, but I haven't showed it to you yet. So let me show you, don't get excited. Uh, this is how traditionally provenance looks, okay? It's just a piece of text. The length of the provenance can go from one paragraph to 100 pages, okay? But it's important that it's clear and that it's organized and that it's complete. Um, this is the traditional format used by most museums and most uh, auction houses. Uh, and they use the different uh, punctuation for different things, okay? So for example, semicolon is if a work has passed directly from two owners. But if it's not clear, those owners, they use a, a period. Brackets are for the life dates of the owners. Uh, parentheses are used for dealers and for auction houses, but not for private owners. So it's to differentiate them. And then they have the footnotes with proofs, okay? Imagine 100 pages of this. This is why technology comes to help us uh, at those times, okay? So te new technologies have helped us uh, in terms of collecting the information, but also in terms of presenting it, okay? So let's see. Uh, a sample of digital provenance. As you can see, it's already an improvement from the previous slide. It contains the same information, but it looks more attractive and it's easier to see all the, all the different parts, okay? Um, it's also more secure and blockchain is one of the, of the technologies um, that can help the art industry, okay? So let's talk a little bit about blockchain. 
So most people associate blockchain with Bitcoin, okay? But cryptocurrencies are only just a little tiny bit of this. Uh, in simple terms, what the blockchain does is it makes sure that the information cannot be changed or manipulated. And this is very important for provenance, okay? A blockchain-based uh, system uh, enables the creation of provenance in a way that it's unalterable, uh, aggregated, you can add pieces as the time goes by, and it's digital. And this means that it's secure, it's integrated, it's accessible, and it's digitalized. Okay. So, for example, on our own case, Waranka, um, we launched our website last year. Okay. We realized that there were many African galleries that they were having problems collecting information, and we signed agreements with uh, over 15 of them. We cataloged all their items. Now, on our website, you can see uh, more than uh, 1,000 artworks from 300 different artists, and anyone from anywhere in the world can buy them. Okay, but why is provenance important to us? Well, we are still a Nigerian company and we are a Nigerian website. And this is the country that made famous the 419. Okay, so if you want to build trust for people to buy on a website uh, in Nigeria, you have to do more than anywhere else in the world. Okay, so what we did is on our case, we partnered with the world leader uh, in certificates of authenticity and uh, digital records, okay? So anyone who buys with us, they receive a certificate from a third party, they get a free account that is linked to a digital record, and with this they can track and they can manage their collections, okay? So these are the type of things that we need to do to also be able to build trust uh, in buyers, okay? So now, while before provenance was completely separate from the item, now it can all be linked. OK, so you have the physical, the physical artwork that you see here. You have a smart, uh, a smart seal. It's like a sticker on the artwork. And this is connected to the provenance in a way that all the information is safe and is unalterable. OK, and also it can obviously be uh, accessed anywhere uh, at any time and from a smartphone. OK, so this this is the potential. This has a, a lot of potential uh, to fight against forgeries and to facilitate uh, sales. But it's also a way of democratizing access to fine art, okay? Because this now people can invest and they can do it even in terms of percentage because everything is recorded online and everything is very clear, okay? So collectors like us, we always think of physical artworks because we like to touch them and we like to see them. Uh, but there are also certified digital artworks called, obviously, NFTs. Uh, they seem to have exploded last year, but they've been around uh, since 2012, more or less. And they record provenance as it goes, okay? Uh, from the moment that the piece is minted, uh, minted is the term that they use for the registration, uh, to any ownership that happens after that, okay? This is bought with cryptocurrency. And the blockchain guarantees that the original or its limited uh, amount of copies are secure and are not reproduced. So this is just to show you how we're using technology as a way of making sure that we keep provenance uh, in an easy way uh, and it's fast uh, and it's safe. Okay, so no matter what we do, we're using technology to improve this, uh, this process of provenance research. And even traditional auction houses, such as Christie's, for example, uh, they've been incorporating NFTs already on their catalogs. This year, as you can see there, uh, Christie's sold for 69.3 million uh, an NFT from uh, this person known as uh, Beeple. Okay. And then the last, this is my last slide already. Um, when we visit an exhibition, we always see an artwork but we never see the provenance, okay? So this is why collectors usually, uh, they're less familiar with the provenance, they're more familiar with the certificate of authenticity because you, you keep it, you know, because it's something that they give you when you buy the item, okay? Uh, us, apart from selling on our website and offering the consultant services, we want to make sure that we educate, that we give access to information and that we promote African art, okay? So this is why very soon, you'll be able to attend an exhibition where you can see the artworks, but you will also be able to see 
or to download the provenance. Okay, so that means that each item will be exhibited with uh, the letters, the love letters, uh, the photographies, and any other materials that are part of the history of this artwork, okay? We will give you more information about this as the date uh, gets closer. And I think this is all. I hope it was not too boring <laughs> and that uh, you learn a little bit more about provenance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. That's really good. So authenticity, valuation, and ownership. Very, 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 very key, key, subject matters as regards provenance. So um, thank you so much, Anna. It was really, really, really informative and really, really resourceful. Thank you. So we're going to jump straight to Adirinka, who's going to be taking the floor. So Adirinka, the floor is yours. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, and for everyone that has joined so far, uh, thank you for joining. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it, OK? so. Um, I, um, Anna's pretty much covered a lot of it, but I think where I am actually going to go directly to is why provenance is important to artists and to collectors. So I'm just gonna share my screen so that you can just read along with me so that um, we can do that together. Just a second. Um, okay. Okay, um, can everybody see this? Okay, so um, personally, I, I believe that the most important thing any artist can do for themselves is to make sure they have a detailed um, report of their work. Why I said so is I remember vividly when I visited Busan Obrafair and there was a piece, it was during an auction because I have been able to uh, work for a weed and auction house for four years. So, the piece came from a source we weren't sure about, and we needed to establish that authenticity. And I had to travel to Abdusazono Paifoya's house, and we had to show him the piece. Surprisingly, Bruce brought it, um, some giant book out of his closet, and I was like, really? So at the end of the day, you, 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 you should understand why it's important to keep a record of your work, because your work can travel, it will travel. And at some point, you might, you might not have the conclusive um, result of your work, but if you can establish the journey, the beginning of your work, it's very important. So we were able to establish when that work was sold to who it was sold to. And I think he had two steps. So he allowed us to trace the history of that work. And we finally got to where the person who brought it to the auction house was actually the genuine owner of the work. So what I'm trying to say is it's important for any artist, if you don't document your work, you've got a very um, huge risk of losing track record of yourself in the markets and losing a lot of um, authenticity in the markets as well. Next is why it's important to collectors. Collectors are the, like the branch of the artwork and they make everything about the artwork what it is today. So first and foremost, I would actually employ any collector out there. If you're not sure about any work you want to acquire, you either seek advice from an art advisor, a consultant, or a certified dealer, qualified dealer, or you work with the gallerist because that way you, you have every reason to be sure and to be able to have that peace of mind that yes, what you're putting your money to is actually what you, would, what you wanted and not some forgery or some copy or a reproduction because we have different stages. There's a forgery, which, well, we can call it forgery reproduction. Yes, I think they both run together and we've had serious cases about that where I think that was even in France, where a lot of artworks were copied and reproduced and sold as the authentic. And that brings me to the recent trip I had to a national trust um, organization recently. There was a reproduction of a porcelain bought from China. And because it kept on generating more sales and the person who forged that item 
kept on making more money off the item. It was National Trust duty to, to, uh, to address that situation because they were in charge of the estate of that um, individual. They had to go arrest the situation and put everything back in order and they collected all the forged items and everything. So when you enter that National Trust location, you can actually see the original as opposed to the forgery. And why they were able to actually trace the forgery was also through provenance because the person who bought the forged one had a document that, yes, I bought this from this person, I bought this, and that person bought it from that person. So provenance is actually very, very important. And the last reason why I said provenance is very important to collectors was as that, um, uh, 2019, yes. I was um, doing a collection management to, with a collector of mine or like a client. I stumbled on another Benel Wu masterpiece. And this Benel masterpiece is called, is, the title is Caroline, I think one of his other wives or something. Strangely, the gentle, well, strangely, the owner did not know that it was actually a wordy masterpiece that he had very close to the exit of his door of his house. So picking up the, I actually even thought it was a print in the first place, but when I picked it up, I found out that it was actually an original which needed a lot of work. So because he had provenance with him and where he got it from, we were able to direct him to where he can actually restore the work. And should, if he was actually interested in reselling the work, it can also work with the same people where we directed him to. So it made it easier for him to actually do whatever he likes with his treasure and make sure he got whatever he wanted with his treasure due to provenance. He was able to produce where he bought it from, even though it was just a receipt of where he bought it from. It wasn't actually like a detailed provenance, but it was a receipt of where he got it. And people were, the people in charge of the process were able to verify that, yes, he actually did get it from this place and they were able to do what they carry out whatever they wanted to do so provenance is an utmost importance like it's very important to any artist any collector and anybody who is actually interested in collecting art if you are just starting it's very important for you to understand how provenance work my colleague already actually has a detailed explanation of what provenance should look like how it works why it's so important as well so Hopefully we'll be able to get to share that with everybody on this um, webinar, maybe after. And she also touched on um, the returns of Benin um, artifacts and work. So I really don't need to touch on that. So I'm gonna, although we have some uh, links where you can actually find some more information on provenance and you can read about it. There, there are loads, loads of articles, loads of write-ups, loads of presentation where you can actually update yourself and get more information on provenance alongside with what we're actually doing today. So if you have, if you have time, you can go to all these links and read up about them just to update yourself and just to make sure you understand exactly what provenance is and why it's so important and how it helps the economy as itself, as a whole. So I'm going to jump right into artists resale rights, because I think that has been so much of a controversy for as long as I can remember. And unfortunately, I don't think it's something that really happens in Nigeria, but we will, it's a case that it has been built up for a while, and I think they are still working on it. Maybe the lawyer in the house will be able to touch on it when it's time for us to speak. But presently, from my understanding, my findings, um, workshops that we've attended, that have attended, uh, programs that have been aired on this so-called topic. It's been a very um, sensitive, well, sensitive, yes, because it's very important to the artists. And we've not been able to have like heads in Nigeria, but there's a case on it. And hopefully it's at some point in time, um, I think things will turn around. But well, let me just quickly talk about it. The artist resale right provides an artist the right to receive royalty based on resale price of the artwork. Now I'm going to jump to the end, to, towards the end slide because I think it will be easier for people to understand if I compare it, if I do a comparison before I now go into the nitty gritty. Okay, so we have musicians in Nigeria, Whiskey, David Doe, all the likes. We have all of them all lined up. 
when their music is being played on radio, on TV, or used as an advert, they get paid some sort of reimbursement is being sent, reimbursement is being sent to them. And as the, the more popular the artist is, the more money gets as a, as a resale right. So we need to understand things. And unfortunately in the visual aspects, I don't think it has actually gotten to, for I know we've not, we are not there yet. It's a case that is ongoing. We're still hoping to actually get it reinstated. So we are still working on it. Okay, and that brings me to go back to um, the beginning and where resale rights actually really started from. And we can look at, we can see it on this particular slide that it actually originated from, I'm going to just go strictly to the history. It originated from France. And this was as a result of having um, a very prominent artist died and later a work of his that he sold for hundred dollars ended up sell selling for $150,000. And you can imagine as that then how much $150,000 is going to be. And there was nothing sent to the family. They, and the family was still in destitute. And you imagine back then there wasn't so much. So People just do what they can do to make money. And then there's some good artist who worked all his life and suddenly dies and then his, his sweat, his creation, suddenly is making some huge money and then the family knows nothing about it. So I think the government actually took it upon themselves to find a way to, to work around that, to get the artist to have some sort of value attached to when his work is being resold. And there, that I think that better the Bene Convention in 1948. So I'm not going to read this out loud so I, because I think this whole information is online. You can actually just Google Bene Convention on resale artists, right? You will find it there. Everything is stated there. The author, the, the reason for the convention, the reason why it was created. And let's just make it that 80, piece, 80 countries in the world have actually joined the. Um, convention. Unfortunately, from the last, um, uh, what's it called? From the last um, workshop or seminar that happened in Nigeria, that was a collaboration between Benio Foundation and the Society of Nigerian Artists. There was this talk and it was, a case was instated for um, artist resale rights. I put the link there, hopefully, so that you can go back to it and read upon it. There's also a YouTube link that you can actually watch. It's actually really detailed because we had most of the experts in the industry come in to talk about it. We had people from Bonhams because Bonhams has another branch in Nigeria, which is also known as Africa now. So they were around to actually give you in-depth information how um, this all resale rights actually does work. But I'm gonna actually, still go into because it's important that people understand what resale right is and what percentage a resale right should be and all that. So in this convention, there was the question that was raised that is Nigeria part of the convention? Nigeria isn't part of the convention and that's what the, um, the, the, um, the seminar was for. It was a, a period where we can find out how do we get Nigeria into this convention? How do we make Nigeria part of this convention? How do we have to, what do we need to do to reinstate AR in Nigeria so that people can start benefiting from their creation? It's actually very important because artists don't make money daily, if you know what I mean. Artists make, make money through projects, through commissions, through exhibitions, and most of them it's not like, every time because an artist needs time to work. So if you have time to work, at the end of the day, you cannot be that productive on daily basis, like just keep producing stuff every now and then. No, creativity doesn't work like that. So we need to understand that for the artist, why artists actually are craving for um, a resale right is for their own benefit, for their after career life. It's very important to them. So um, I'll jump to the next slide to give an example, what resale rights do, how much it is, um, what is expected, how much is most likely going to get to the artist. 
Okay, so the Nigeria market is actually a very big market right now. It, and every year it keeps growing. And even as it's growing, nothing goes back to the Nigerian artist, the person who created the work. Okay, for example, which I know that it was actually talked on in the same seminar I just talked about in 2019, yes. Um, the missing Nigerian taste, the Benel would have made so much news in press, sold at 1.2 M. If we're going to do the artist's resale rights on that, it would give us an estimate value of 60,000 pounds. I actually used 5%, but I think it's between four to 5%, depending on whatever country it is and whatever, um, whatever laws are attached to that, because I think the government actually decides what percentage should go to the artist. But I use this because from my research, what I've seen, some people actually, some countries do four, some countries do five, depending on whatever the government approves. So this is just an estimate figure. It's not the detailed one. So um, yeah, so imagine if you have all the Benemo works that were sold over in the last, give or take six, five, six years, sold in auction, and then you have artists with civil rights come to the family's estate. Imagine how much that would do for the family, what it would help the family to do and all that. So this, these are the things, these are the questions that come in. These are the things that people wonder if it's, if it's right. And then let's not forget that sometimes the, the house doesn't really have much to say about the, the, the auction house doesn't, might not have much to say about the resale rights. Sometimes it's always the, um, the collector that might have to say something about the resale rights. So we have to be very, um, a bit mindful about that as well, because um, sometimes it might not be the auction house that is paying the resale rights. It might just be the owner of the work. So it, it varies depending on what the law is on ground as well. So maybe um, she will be able to help us with that. We don't, I don't think we have any right now in Nigeria. So maybe other laws that apply might be able to um, explain, give a broad explanation on what exactly it's, it should be and how it should be. Same goes for Indijeka's work that got sold as well. If there was an artist right on it, you would get possibly that figure that you see there. And that's just an estimate as well. So um, that brings me to the importance as well. And I have to go back to that so that I can actually put that there and let people understand. It, the resale right successfully balances the interest of the artist and the, I'm sorry, I couldn't see that very well. I hope I'm reading it right. Um, sorry, let me just move this. Yeah, that's right, actually. So, um, and the, at the on, and recognize the ongoing stake of the artist as in the economic value of the work. AR is not only important mechanism supporting artists and their assets, it will be a significant driver of Nigeria's thriving creative economy. Nigeria is really, really booming right now. And it's, it's important that we don't leave visual artists out of it. So if, um, I want to use this case study of, uh, but I wrote this case study of an artist, Davido, because it's important for us to actually understand that what resale rights can do. David Dell was one of the prominent artists in Nigeria as well. And at some point in his life, he fell ill. And there were um, exhibitions that had to do some sort of fundraising for him. Now, this is where resale right comes in. If there has been resale rights on his work for the past couple of years, I'm very certain at some, somehow there must have been savings to allow him treat himself and stuff like that, money come in for him. And that way they, we don't have to start running around to do fundraising and making sure people understand the, how, how creative this person is. That's what resale rights should do. That's what, why it should be instated. And that's what I think a lot of artists actually create for because the, the AI would be most helpful when it's most needed. And that was, at that time, that was what the AI was really needed for. So um, I'll quickly jump so that I don't spend much time. And hopefully all the links I've left on this, um, this presentation would help people go back and actually read more. Why we, I really don't wanna talk much about this right now because we really don't have any form of, um, 
documentation in Nigeria when it comes to artist rights. The case is ongoing, so people can actually go back and still watch the video link that I said and read up about it. But there are a few things that do not apply in, a, in the artist rights, um, artist retail rights. And one thing everybody should know is when your work gets sold in a, in a gallery, the first primary work, you, your work sold, like if you're a young artist, you just reproduce, your, you just produce your work and it's in the gallery, you don't get a resale right. Resale right takes time. It takes, the, the, the work must have generated some sort of history, some sort of value, some sort of uh, longevity and all that. So it's, it's, it takes time and then, Private sales, because people do private sales. You don't go to the authorities. You don't go to the people in charge of this whole thing. You don't go to them to say you want to sell your work and they don't do. So resale rights mostly applies to the second, the people who are in charge of the secondary markets, auction houses, art fairs and stuff like that. So if you're a collector, you have a, 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 your collection and you want to just do a private sale, you do not have to do pay resale rights to any artist. And then, like I said, resale rights also do not apply to artworks sold in countries that do not have ARR. So um, on that note, I think I've covered a few bits on resale rights. I have a few links attached to the old work and you can always read up on them. I have some on the, um, on the, the real, uh, why, when the, like the resale rights in the UK, Maybe if you read up on the resale rights in the UK, you'll be able to understand how resale rights works in the UK. And hopefully that can apply to us when it's instated in Nigeria as well. Thank you so much, Adenika. That's fantastic. You know, I, 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 I think the slides are really, really, really educative and, you know, as, as giving us some really delicate information around you know, um, the world of, of artist resale rights and, um, you know, the all important burn convention and to note that Nigeria is not a part, I think that's really, really vital information, something that we should take, we should take note of. So thank you so, uh, thank you so much, um, Bianca. It's really been, been, you know, great listening to you and learning from you as well. Um, again, once again, for those who have joined us, um, we're welcome to Society for Arts Collection second webinar around uh, provenance and resale rights. I want to thank you for joining us wherever you might be around the world. And if you have questions, please kindly feel free to put your questions in the chat um, chat box on, on your on the right hand side of your screen. Let's just have, um, you know, our uh, guest facilitators are here to take up all any questions you might have on provenance and, and resale rights. So without further ado, we're going to jump right straight to our, our third um, guest who will be talking about all things law around this very all important subject. So let, welcome to you, as she takes the floor. Welcome to you, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Obi, and good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, good. All right, sorry, let me just... Okay. All right, so I'll be talking on the importance of provenance and resale rights, the legal issues that are arising from same. So I will start first with provenance. Um, as we all heard, um, the previous uh, presenters already addressed provenance and like resale rights properly. They did a very good job. So I wouldn't really do too much on it, but I will just touch it briefly. So as already stated, provenance is the paper trail which shows the creation of copyrighted works. And for the purpose of this presentation, I'll, I will be sticking to artistic works or artworks in particular. And um, it ultimately identifies the author of the works and then it follows the artistic works through the changes in hands over the years. So diligent artists and like art dealers will typically have like a very good documentation of like um, how the artworks have moved through the years. This is very important because it determines the commercial value of the of the artworks as well as um, it just makes the, the artist seem more serious. Now, if you're an artist listening to this presentation right now, and this is a sign to please start documenting your works properly, as in turn, it would benefit you tremendously. So I'll just get right into it. So what are the legal importance of keeping good provenance? 
So essentially, keeping a very good provenance would evidence the time the work was created, right? So this is very crucial because for copyright, copyrights subsist upon the creation of the work. It's automatic. You don't have to register it at the Nigerian Copyright Commission. It just it's it's instant. It also is important to keep provenance because you can determine the duration of the copyright and the protection that would ensue to like the, the artist or his or her heirs and assigns. So it also is important for the identification of the owner of the legal title of the work. I would just uh, try to expatiate further on them. So now for the establishment of the time of creation of the work, as I've already said, Provenance is the paper trail which establishes when the copyrighted work was created. Um, essentially, there are different types of copyright. There's literary, musical, have different period, different uh, time frames um, during which the copyright will exist. For literary, musical, and artistic works, it's typically 70 years from the date the author, that's the creator of the work, has died. Um, and then the other is cinematographic films, photographs, sound recordings are typically 50 years after they've first been published. Keeping good provenance would help in identifying the holder of the legal title. And this is very, very important. This is because sometimes some artworks um, in people's possessions have been consigned to them, leased, loaned, um, maybe left, you know, forgotten, sometimes even stolen. And in such circumstances where a person who claims to have legal title passes on the title to a, an innocent uh, buyer, that there, there, there will be no title that will be transferred because you cannot transfer titles that you don't have. Now, the danger in not having good finance is that, you know, the fraudulent sales, um, forgeries, all of this, these are like serious concerns because they happen, they've been happening in the world. The huge arts market is constant. Like, honestly, there's a lot of doubt as to the amount of works that are authentic. So a good provenance should obviously state the details um, of the creation of the work and then the persons who have, who have a, the, the persons who have bought the works in, in the, over the years, as well as the lawful owner of the artistic work. I think Anna like really elaborated on this. She talked about how you should also know um, where the artwork is currently. I thought Anna or Adiran Kim, not sure. Now, having good provenance is, is very great for if uh, you're trying to basically institute legal proceedings. Good provenance would be used as evidence. You could always like point to that document in the court of law showing that the work was created at this time. So in circumstances where people reproduce or imitate your work, basically copy your work, you could always you know, take it to the court of law after trying to obviously amicably settle. And you can prove beyond, before the courts that your, your um, copyrighted work existed before the fake work, so to say. Now, how does provenance help authors and holders of copyrights? As I've said, it could be used as evidence to show that the copyright existed before the infringing works. Under the Nigerian Copyright Law or Act, the law provides that where a person is found to be guilty of infringing copyrights, he may be liable to either damages, accounts for profits, imprisonment, depending on really the nature of the infringement. Essentially, um, you can bring civil or criminal proceedings against an infringing party. The courts would also order relief such as account for profits, meaning all the profits um, the infringer has made by selling your work would go to, to you, as well as damages and prison time. Now I will move on to resale rights. And um, I feel like, you know, Adiranke has spoken about this and talked about how, you know, in, in Nigeria right now, we don't really know what the status is. And this is so true. Um, it is it is a, a concept that we really need to like the, the art industry in Nigeria, the, the legal, the, the, the judges, we need to really, you know, embrace it because it will help make the lives of artists much, much better. Now, it's not uncommon for artists to be entitled to proceeds of um, sales of their works long after they've sold it to the first, like the initial buyer. Right now, the rationale for resale rights really is that artists should benefit from like increase in value of their works over the years. And for me, I, I, I strongly 
agree with this because the thing is, as an artist, the, the artwork increases in value as you, as you progress your career. Now, if you're a lazy artist, that's, that, that would pretty much be the end, unless you're very skilled and very talented. But otherwise, the artist is responsible for the growth and the, the, the increase in value of the artwork. And I, I believe that it should be um, rewarded in, in such situations. Now, some countries have resale rights included in their legislation. In Nigeria, we have resale rights as well, but it's a very limited scope. And it, it, I think it only applies to three-dimensional works, and manuscripts, and graphic works. You can look at Section 13 of the Copyright Act of Nigeria. And the Act essentially provides that authors of graphic works, three-dimensional works, and manuscripts shall have an inalienable right to a share in the proceeds of any sale of that work or manuscript in a public auction or through an art dealer. Now, it, this further limits it. So private sales or sales between, um, sales between friends, you know, sales that aren't like public auctions, this, this, it, it's, it's, the act implies that, or the wording is rather implies that you, like as an artist, you would not be able to get any um, proceeds of the resale in that circumstance. And I feel like that should definitely be um, tweaked. Now, um, I'm going to talk about resale rights under the Berne Convention. Now, um, so Nigeria is actually a contracting party under the Berne Convention. And this essentially means that um, Nigeria has uh, consented to be, <clears throat> consented to, to pretty much um, follow the provisions of the convention. You can always check the um, WIPO websites. Um, I think this was done back in 1993 or so. Now, in particular, Article 14 <clears throat> of the convention states that artists, specifically artists that, that are creators of um, works of art or manuscripts, literary works, have a right to an interest in resales. It further provides that the author of the work after his or the pet or, or his next his heirs and next in the signs or institutions authorized by national legislation shall with respect to the original works of art and original manuscripts of writers and composers enjoy the inalienable right to an interest in any sale of the work following the first transfer by the author of the work. Now, this would imply that um, in the, the, the scope of a uh, protection provided in Article 14 can only be claimed in a country of the Union where the legislation of that country to which the author belongs permits it and to the extent permitted by the, the country. Now, Nigeria has already limited it to just graphic works, to just um, manuscripts and three-dimensional works. So unfortunately for us, it's like, you know, they give you a cake and they say, no, just have a slice. You can't have the, <laughs> you can't have the entire thing. So um, definitely this is something that I think um, the, the country needs to reform for the Copyright you know, Act has to, to, con to consider. Sorry. So I also thought that it would be interesting to talk about the role of collecting societies. And they're also known as collective management organizations. I think that they could definitely play a part in, in um, royalties, you know, enforcement and receipt of royalties, as well as proceeds of resale of art. Now, collection societies are essentially in charge of negotiating and granting copyright licenses and collecting royalties on behalf of copyright owners and distributing same to them. Uh, there's been a regulation that was released in 20, 2007, which essentially states that um, the collecting society is um, in charge of drawing up like tariffs in respect of remuneration. Um, it demands for usage of copyrights for its members as so the, the artist. It also sets the, the tariff. Um, it has to consider the monetary advantage to be, to be obtained by the artist in, in, in comparison to the exploitation. Um, it also talks about distribution of royalties as well. Um, right now, the collective societies don't really play a huge role, but like, there definitely is some leeway for them to do more. Um, Maybe in time, this will be considered, but as for right now, nothing besides this is nothing done. 
Now, in conclusion, provenance is very key for development of the arts. Like, it is very essential in resolving like illegal disputes, not just for the authors of the works and the sellers, but also for art collectors and the art world at large. Now, the development of provenance as a great practice will do wonders for the Nigerian arts because this will put us, the artists of the country, really, um, on a semi equal footing with um, foreigners in the wider international arts market. It will also help in the management of copyright infringement. It will help limit and reduce forgeries, fraud, outright misappropriation of arts and misrepresentation of legal ownership. Um, next up is, there's also a negligible amount of case law um, in regards to the interpretation and enforcement of resale rights in the country. Um, and I, I believe that this is because sometimes people don't know their rights. And if you don't know your rights, you can't fight for your rights. You won't go to court. So there will be no development in the area. Now, this is a disservice. We definitely, artists definitely need to um, start fighting, not fighting, but asking, asking for what they actually deserve. Um, ultimately, resale rights in Nigeria is a concept that needs to be better developed. Like collecting societies, collective management organizations have a huge role to play. Um, I had a, asked a question, a rhetorical question, where I said, is, is there a case for artists who believe that they should be entitled to proceeds of sales of their work after subsequent sales and increase in value? My, I, I, the answer is yes. Yes, I believe that we all agree that the answer is yes. So Resale West will ultimately reward artists, especially in these present times where art is the new liquid gold. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I hope I did not bore anyone with my legal terms. Thank you very much, Tinya. It's really, really, really great. Thank you so much. And it's it's really, really, a, you know, a really, really, Interesting um, when you talk about the legal aspects of of of, of visitor rights and provenance. Thank you so much. So um, I want to welcome everybody again and thank you for joining us. Um, this is now an opportunity for us to ask questions, and um, we have a question here. I'm going to be directing this to uh, to Adir and Kep. The question goes. Um, um, Given that the all-important burn convention has not yet been domesticated in Nigeria, how should we optimally approach the question of resale rights in the arts? Don't care. Okay, so um, I believe there's an ongoing, um, uh, what do you say, initiation in for it. So um, I think, well, I believe um, the Ca Council of Arts in Nigeria and a few of the um, lead member uh, societies of Nigeria who are in charge of um, Nigerian art should come together and also talk to the minister as well, because I think that's what um, they're actually doing right now, but it's yet to, um, because like Tineri said, there are other um, areas where the Benin Commission has actually approved things um, things in art. So we need to be able to find a way for visual arts to get on board as well. So I think those bodies in Nigeria, like the Council of Arts in Nigeria and the Society of Arts in Nigeria and a few other foundations, like the Benemo Foundation who has already started a case for it. I feel they can come together to start some sort of initiation, which I think they have already. But it's, like I said, there's so much controversy on it and it's still like an ongoing process. But I think if those bodies come together and involve the government and see how they can put in a legislation about the resale rights for visual artists, I think some way we would have an headway. I think so. Thank you very much, Adirinka. Thank you so much for the response. I want to also um, implore our, our special guests, uh, our panel, those of us who are here, we have questions around the civil rights and provenance, and it's a good time to engage um, to engage our speakers. So feel free to ask your questions. And um, in the meantime, I want to recognize uh, the presence of some um, really special people who have joined. Uh, we have two esteemed members of our governing council member members of Society for Art Collection. We want to recognize the presence of Professor Fabian Ajogu, who is 
one of our council members. Welcome, sir. It's a pleasure to have you here, sir. Yeah, we also uh, want to welcome uh, Ms., uh, Professor Jess Castellote, who is, I'm sure he's very well known, <laughs> he's very well known in, in the art society and art circles. Yeah, he, he's, he is, he is, you're very welcome, Jess. Uh, it's good to have you here. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, so we're looking to get questions. Um, in the meantime, um, the, the Society for Art Collection is, like you had mentioned, a society that is a registered charity committed to providing a platform to exchange of ideas amongst art collectors while promoting appreciation for the arts, and which is what is happening today. You know, educating the arts and making sure that we, you know, provide all the you know all the necessary information and education around art collection and. You know, it's a society that um, welcome members. And if you feel that you want to get to know what, what the society is doing, you know, to understand how it is that we operate, you know, we welcome you to become a member today. And um, the, um, the website is pretty much there where you can get all the information that you want. It's in the, it's in the message board and we welcome new members, you know, to join us even as we, you know, democratize art collection and everything around arts, you know. So um, are there are questions uh, that we want to entertain, and, you know, what, and this all these important questions. So, Prof. Well, thank you very much, uh, um, Anna, and to our very distinguished panelists, Anna, Adderonke, and Chinyere. Before I put my question, this is probably the first time I get this golden privilege to be on the crying side of gender now, uh, given that your panel is um, me cry the same way, uh, gender insensitive, or maybe then that's an enlightenment. Thank you for very insightful uh, you know, discussions on the issue of provenance and resale rights. Now, I was more concerned about the unbundling of rights, particularly in the Nigerian environment, um, given that some of the things we see, and I'll just be give a practical illustration. When today you find the young people watch uh, Marvels, Marvels is a bundle of artistic expressions that were common in those days. The Iron Man or all of the people that make billions of dollars in, in, in Hollywood were essentially um, artistic expressions in the form of cartoons. And here you have resale rights. My concern is how should we begin to marry in your thoughts the, the world of the um, visual artistic work with what today is a huge opportunity uh, in other media, including movies. There doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, bridge, especially in the environment, this field. But I mean, a lot has happened in this particular field in other environments and has created um, huge wealth. You see movies grossing a billion dollars. Um, and this has come from little comics. So what are your thoughts uh, on, on this? Thank you very much. Adirka, do you want to, you want to, you want to, you want to tackle that? Yeah, I think, um, like I said, it's um, it's important for stakeholders to to find a way to draw an action plan for all the artists' resale rights. We start from there, and then we move on to an area where we know that there's some sort of control. Like once the legislation is in place. I'm sure there's definitely going to be like a control to get us to that direction. Because yes, I understand that what you said about movies grossing a lot and the parties as well. So, but um, it's still important that we first <laughs> install that the, um, the rights because I think it's like a branch and that would actually propel and lead to other areas. Without that, I don't know if um, it's possible to move on to the next stages. I'm not sure if Anna could could add to this, but for my thinking, I think we need to start from there first, and then we move on to the next stage. And once that is done, every other thing goes. It's good, probably much going to be like a ripple effect. So yes. 
So Anna, would you want, would like to reflect on this on this question? So in my opinion, we're, we're all here to learn, and this is what we do as well as societies. So if this is already done in other countries, there's no reason why you should not, we should not be able to do it here. It's a matter of putting, uh, making sure that the institutions that are behind it are able to kind of copy, because we don't have to invent the wheel now. It's about copying already the systems that exist in other countries and adapt them maybe to the environment in Nigeria. But it's, it's, we don't have to invent anything else. So yes, it's difficult in the fact that you have to put together the right people and you have to make sure that they make the right decisions. But the systems are there already in other countries. So it's, it's kind of a matter of copying. So Jess, uh, Jess has his hands up. Jess. and the student of these matters. I, I don't know much, but I think we are taking for granted that there, there should be a right. I think right is a very strong word. Uh, now, for instance, Anna says um, that it is in, uh, in other countries. It is not in every country. Uh, for instance, in the States, uh, you know well, the, this was, there was only one place where this was, there was a law for this, was in California. Uh, a law that was passed, I don't remember, I think it must have been at the end of the 70s, and eventually the Supreme Court said no. So now they do not have resale rights in the US. Uh, I think that this is a matter that is not close, that is open to, to discussion. I, I'm in favor because I see the advantages, but I think uh, it, it, this is arguable. Let's say that there are many other issues where there are resale um, processes where you don't have a right. Let's say if I have a, a very nice piece of land uh, or a, a land that is not very nice, now I, I sell it and for whatever reason, uh, the not the location, but the circumstances change uh, and that land becomes very valuable. Should I ask for some resale money? Nobody will say, or mo I guess most people will say no. Now, what is so special with art? There is something special with art. I agree. There is a, a creative process. But uh, I think th this, this issue is not as close as some people, especially uh, societies of, of collectives of artists that have a, a, an interest in getting this. I think the issue is much more open to, to discussion. So that's my only little view on this, that, that I, I think we should tread a little bit more carefully. Um, it's convenient, in my opinion, yes, should be a right, I'm not so sure. Thank you, Jess. Thank you very much for that intervention. So um, we have another question, and um, um, this is directed to Chinier, and how, so, how, so how can information get to the man or woman on the street who is upcoming and has no idea of what their rights as regards resales. So what do you think, Chinere, about this? So I think that that's a very important question because there are lots of upcoming artists who don't really know what to do. Um, but the, the, the hard part is, it's a bit, he said, but the easy part is that it is available online. You could always pick out some, open up, search for copyrights acts. As your, I'm guessing your visual artist, the copyright act is what is going to apply. You go through it; it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to read through. You could always seek clarification from a lawyer to assist you where you don't understand certain things. Um, but ultimately, the the art industry, the the legal rights surrounding um, artists is very, very complicated, and you definitely will need to seek. Um, another opinion or a legal opinion. Thank you very much, Tina. There's another um, interesting question here. Um, it says, based on the foregoing discussions, does it mean that Nigerian artists and stars whose videos and music are played on YouTube and Netflix do not currently get paid? And if so, should this not be a matter of contract between the artists and these companies based on existing international law or law of jurisdiction or where the companies are based? So, Chinua, I think it's another legal, another legal question. 
as regards um, artist rights and creators rights? Okay, um, yeah, well, thank you, Osisa, for that question. Well, I mean, ultimately, it would always be about what was signed between the Nigerian artist and the, um, the company. Um, I'm not quite sure what the, and I'm guessing there are different contracts. I'm not quite sure what the contents of each contract is, um, but I don't believe that um, Netflix or the or YouTube don't pay their, their, um, the, the people that they're pretty much using their content for. Um, it, it really is going to have to be a case by case, like, um, situ like analysis of the situation. We can talk further about this afterwards because um, the, the question isn't very clear to me. Um, hi, Osita. I can quickly respond to um, a little bit around that question. Now, for things like um, YouTube, for instance, I know pretty much about YouTube. And what happens is that once you have a YouTube channel, once you monetize your channel, it is, it is constantly monetized. As long as you've reached, you know, you've reached the, the parameters for earning money on YouTube, you get paid for, you know, each, as long as you, the video you upload, hits the right parameters, you get paid. So you have to, I think for you to get, to get monetized, you have to hit about, um, have about at least 4,000 watch hours and have, had, have at least a thousand subscribers and continuously in perpetuity, you earn money for, you know, the videos you upload to YouTube. So that, that's an ongoing thing. Now for Netflix, it depends, it's all contractual, it depends on the sort of agreements that you are signing with Netflix, for instance. The, it could be an acquisition, they could buy the entire rights of the content from you and pay you a really, really big sum or they could it could be lease and if you're listing the content um if the content is going to be on their platform for one year two years three years there's a negotiation that happens and you get paid so i think for those ones are pretty, pretty much clear um before we go on we just want to recognize the you know the presence of some really highly esteemed people we have professor enasa o'connor deputy vice chancellor of the pan-atlantic university we want to welcome you thank you for joining us um it's pleasure to have you we also have in our presence uh, Mrs. Sandra Obiago of SMO Contemporary Arts. And she, you know, she, we really have to recognize her for the great work she's doing with restoring, you know, arts in the National Theater. Thank you so much for joining us, madam. And we've also got uh, Mrs. Ifoma Jogo, a design artist. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you here. Um, we also want to recognize the presence of Mrs. Ihuaru Akachiko of the CSCS. Thank you so much for joining us. So are there other questions? Um, there's questions, this is really, really interesting. It's a, rare, it's a rare opportunity to have this really, really, you know, um, really, really special ladies in our midst with all this information and knowledge. So let's just ask away and, you know, um, so are there any other questions, any other remarks, any other additions, any other thing we want to add, you know? Okay. Um, just a reminder that um, you could um, inviting everyone to become members of society uh, with the the site is right there where you can find a membership form. You know, um, this is something that we take very seriously educating, you know, all stakeholders around really, really important subjects regarding, you know, the arts and, and the practice of the arts and the appreciation of the arts is really important because at the Society for Art Collection, we feel that education and having the right information is what is really going to liberate us and actually put us where we need to be. You know, it's also a catalyst for nation building because when we understand our cultural values and the things that actually, you know, um, make us exactly what we are, our identity is not lost and it, it really helps, it goes a long way. I also want to recognize the presence of engineer Peter Bankoli, director of the Enterprise Center for Development. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here, sir. The membership form can be found on the web society's website. So the society's website, www.satcall.org. Once you navigate the site, you will find the membership form there. We also want to say, uh, kindly follow us on all our social media platforms. We're on LinkedIn, um, Society for Art Collection. We're on Instagram at Society for Art Collection. Uh, we're on Facebook as well. So, um, yes. Uh, thank you very much. So we are nearing the end of the session. Um, we want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you to our highly esteemed speakers, Adiranke, Anna, 
and Chinyere, you've done justice to this subject matter. And I and, um, want to say thank you very much for, for taking out time, precious time. I mean, everybody's really busy. It's a really busy time. So thank you so much. And thank you to our guests who have joined us um, from different parts of the world, wherever you might be. Thank you so much for joining us, for taking out time. This recording will be made available um, on, on YouTube. In the coming days that we can go back and listen to it and, and learn and, and don't forget to send us an email inquiries at sackhall.org on the website you find the membership form and inquiries around becoming a member and also you want to have you know maybe the other questions you want to ask about at collection you know and also reaching out to our, our esteemed guests please feel free to you know send in your inquiries we're here to listen to all that you have to tell us about. Thank you so much for being a part of this um, seminar. Thank you so much for joining us and um, look out for our updates, look out for information from society on all our social media platforms on our website. And thank you so much. Um, have a great day, everyone, and, and stay safe. Yeah, cheers. Bye-bye.